again, it's a great privilege to be here and especially to speak this morning. My wife and I have grown fond of the Wagon Shoots family for quite several years. Uh, it began when they were in Bible college and uh, I was a young preacher. At one time I was young, you know. I mean, th th this didn't all of a sudden, I wasn't like this all the time. And I tell the children that I teach in school, I said, you know, I was your age at one time. But they look at me quizzically and nod their, shake their head and such. Uh, it's a blessing that you're here to commemorate and celebrate uh, this great event. You know, the longevity of a pastor is a tribute to two groups of people. It's a tribute, first of all, of course, to the pastor and his family, that they remain in a state or in a city, in a church for a long period of time. And 30 years is a long period of time. But in eternity, that doesn't seem to be too long, does it? It's just a glimmer of time. But also to the congregation. It's a tribute to those who have decided that with their pastor serving the Lord, that they also will serve the Lord uh, together. I recall an incident years ago. This is a tale I'm telling on Brother Wagon Shoots. I better do the correct thing. Uh, turn, turn to Philippians chapter 3 while we're spending some time. Chapter 4. Chapter 4. But uh, some years ago, I asked Brother Wagon Shoots to come to our fellowship meeting and preach a message. He did that uh, Friday night. My son Jason had worked at uh, Burger King and he got off just in time to get there. And at the end of the message, he walked the aisle and trusted Christ as Savior. Thank you, Brother Mark. You've always been a blessing to us. Years ago, I was told that if a man stays in a church, pastoring a church for three years, that's generally the average. Can you think of that? Three years. And yet, the Wang and Shoots family have been here for 30 years. Let me give you this thought. Success is not measured by what is accomplished, <clears throat> but by what is accomplished to compare with what should be accomplished. I was uh, seeing a commercial. Most of the time, if I'm watching any TV, I try to blink out the, the commercials or such like. But I, this one kind of caught my eye, and I, I noticed that there was an older woman that had walked up to a... By the way, I'm kind of older too, aren't I now? Anyway, an older woman walked up to an intersection. The light had stopped her, and she was stopped there, and all of a sudden began to cross the street. And the young man came and hooked her arm under her arm and escorted her across the street. Well, then when she got to the other side, she was kind of wobbly, and I thought, how nice, you know, a younger man. Now, I don't remember what the commercial was about. I just remembered this, this event. And she's shaking as she goes across the street. She gets over on the other side along with him. She uncouples the arm and turns around and walks back the direction that they had come and then crosses the street a different way. And I'm saying that this morning, that as a pastor, I understand that. <laughs> that oftentimes a pastor hooks arms with some of the parishioners and trying to take them in a direction that he believes God is leading them in. But they shake loose and turn and walk their own direction. As a pastor, I understand that. Uh, just before we left Racine, we had gone to breakfast at our favorite place. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but anyway, we had come acquainted with the individual who was the manager of that place, and now he is a district manager, and uh, I had tried to witness to him several times, invited him to come to our church, and he did, but the 
Strange thing was he came in the doors of the church and stood back in the foyer as the message was being preached. But I said to him the other day as we were getting ready to leave, I touched him on the arm and I said, I'm concerned about you and where you're going. And he looked at me and quipped at me and said, uh, I will wind up where I'm supposed to. I retorted back to him and said, uh, I'm concerned about where you should be going, heaven. And it wasn't but just a moment, and he turned and left and went a different direction. Yeah. That kind of is the way that oftentimes with a pastor, a pastor is more concerned about the people than sometimes the people are concerned about themselves and the direction in which they go. I hope that's not the way it is here. It seems that so many have come today, and that's a blessing. Let's take a look at Philippians chapter 4 and see what the Holy Spirit would reveal to us, beginning at verse 7. And this is, listen, I, I'm originally from Kentucky, so I'm just a simpleton, and it's just a simple message. There's nothing... Uh, real deep in what I'm going to say or speak today. But my hope and my prayer has been that I prayed that it will talk to your heart. I'm not here to talk to your head. I'm here to speak to your heart. And I want the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Look what it says. Verse 7, begin there. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, that's a great verse. Uh, <clears throat> I have read that and tried to practice that. Lord, I need your peace, first of all, to work on my mind and let it sift down to my heart. And you said that your peace, your peace will take care of that. It'll keep my mind and it'll keep my heart. And then he follows with this, the Apostle Paul writing this. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Lord, you're, you're telling us how we're supposed to think. In teaching school the other day, uh, I talked to the children and I said, in Matthew, it talks about the attitudes, be attitudes, be of this attitude. In other words, how do you think? And it's telling us here how we're to think. God is telling us that there is a way that we as believers ought to think. Now, I could go down and itemize each one of these, but I have a clue that you've probably been taught that through the years anyway because I know the man who's been speaking and teaching. But I want to dwell not just on how you think, and we knew, knew, uh, do need to do that, but I want to dwell on the next verse because the next verse talks about how we should act. In other words, our thinking is right. If our thinking's right, our actions ought to be right. Verse 9 says, These things, these things, which ye have both, what? Learned, received, heard, and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now, in verse 7, it says peace with God, or the peace of God. That's one thing. But now it says the God of peace. And so I want to take those uh, four or five words for just a few minutes and try to explain to you, where do you go from here as a church? Now, you've had the last 51 years and the last 30 years with this pastor, but where do you go now? How do you go now? Well, I believe, first of all, it is involved with what Paul is saying here. By the way, Paul writes this in around 64 AD. And in two years, Paul steps off the scene. So here's a man that is revealing 
what God has to say to us. And by the way, he has written 14 other, uh, 13 other books of the Bible. And this, uh, this portion here, he seems to declare unto us some personal things that he's writing to a church. You see, Paul wrote to an individual. Paul wrote to a group of individuals. And then Paul also wrote to churches. And this happens to be a church. And he says, those things which ye have both what? Learned. Uh, beloved, uh, do what you've learned. Right. Do what you've yeah. learned. Uh, the challenge that I give to you, and it, and it is a challenge, is that we need to do what we've learned. In other words, what you have been taught. Uh, you've been taught solid doctrine. And doctrine to fortify your faith. In other words, you've been taught the truth from God's word. And the pastor has taught you that over the years. But are you doing what you've learned? Are you putting into practice the things that you've learned? I find oftentimes that Christians, <clears throat> they have a head knowledge, but it doesn't drift down to the heart because when it drifts down to the heart, then all of a sudden everything works in concert and we see that they do what they have been taught that they should do. And my question is to you, or better yet, my challenge is to you, just do what you've learned. Do what you've been taught. Follow the Lord. Serve Him. Understand doctrine. Understand truth. Put it not in your head, but put it in your heart. May it come down and begin to work out in your life and in your living. It is our responsibility to learn our faith. Pastor teaches, people learn. Uh, now, I told you, I'm, I'm kind of a simpleton. I'm from Kentucky, and we uh, have kind of simple phrases back there. And so, now, I, I can talk like Kentucky if you want me to. <laughs> However, I think you would better understand talking to you this way, do you? Especially being where we are. <clears throat> But growing up, being a young man, and by the way, I come from a home and family that no one went past the eighth grade. I came from a lost family. You see, my father and mother, my aunts and uncles, to my knowledge, were not saved. They had a moral standard about them, but they were not born again. But I remember dad... And the phraseology that I would hear is, they would say, learn me this. Learn me this. They wouldn't say, teach me this. And I understand that that's more correct, but learn me this. And I got the concept as a young man that when you learn this, that means that you take what has been taught to you and you put it into practice. Sure. I think that's good biblical understanding, don't you? Right. Learn me this. And I'm not trying to get you to speak like a Kentuckian, but anyway, speak like a Wisconsinite north up here and uh, do what you've learned. Uh, I come to the next word. The next word says, uh, those things which ye have learned and received. Received. What does it mean here? Uh, I use the term caught. You know, Christians do not grow just because they're exposed. Sure. You know, you can expose litmus paper and uh, it will indicate what it's exposed to. But we as human beings, we don't operate that way. In other words, we hear it, it's taught, we, it sifts down from the mind, and we must allow it to be caught. In other words, come to our heart in order for it to be practiced. Uh, facts in the head is not enough. It needs to be the truth in the heart that causes us now to receive. In other words, catch what you've been taught, catch what you've learned, 
and then put it into practice. Just do it. Oh, wait a minute. That's another commercial, isn't it? Uh, those tennis shoes that say, just do it. Every time I see that, I think of the word Nike. This is not a commercial. It is not a commercial. You see, the word Nike in our Bible is used for two other words, overcomer and victory. And every time I see that, I think, praise the Lord, Nike, overcomer. We are to be overcomers, beloved. Amen. Have you learned what's been taught Amen. and have you caught what you've learned? In other words, what's been exposed to you. Just do it. Just do it. I come to a third word. Look what it says. Those things which you have both learned and received and what? Heard. I go back to my Kentucky upbringing. My dad would say, did you hear me? And I'd say, yes, sir. My dad, his definition of hearing him was not that the sound hit my ear and it kind of understood what was there. Right. My dad uh, meant that if you hear him, that you should hear the pitter-patter of little feet fulfilling what he's told you to do. You know, that's sound Bible truth. Have you heard? Just do what you've heard. Amen. You have been prompted. You've been prodded. You've been provoked, I'm sure, by this pastor and others. And my question is, have you, do you really understand what he is trying to get you to do. I go back to the illustration of the older lady walking across the street. That's not the direction she wanted to go. The young man misunderstood. Are you going in the direction that Pastor Wagon shoots and his family have been directing you, or are you going in your own direction? Well, I don't think you're supposed to follow a man. Boy, we're all in trouble, aren't we? Listen, we follow men all the time. Sure. Coming, driving up here the other day, I got behind some people and followed them up here. I didn't criticize them. I just followed them. I, uh, I think of a boy, as a boy, dad saying to me, did you hear what I had to say? In other words, do you understand what I'm trying to get you to do? And uh, <clears throat> dad had a, kind of an instant way of giving you incentive to hear what he said and to do what he said to do. Uh, go with me, if you would, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Notice here, do this. Do what you've heard. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making, uh, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Uh, you've heard the music. The music gave a message about being true, being faithful, serving the Lord. Did you hear it? Careful, clearly. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1 for just a moment. Notice what he says here. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 13 with me. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Are we doing what we've heard that we should be doing. Did you learn? Sure. Did you receive? Have you heard? I move to a fourth word. Look at the fourth word. Those things which you have both learned, received, heard, and what? Seen in me. Hmm. I go back to the phrase again. Just do it. That's the challenge. Just yeah. do what you've learned, what you've received, what you've heard, just do it. But now it comes to seeing something, that which we have seen. 
these are living examples. You know, it's not just what a preacher says or teaches, but it's what you see in their lives. They become living examples. Living examples. And so the Wagon Shoots family for 30 years have been living examples to each of you to do what God wants you to do and to continue because they are concerned for your soul. I, I believe the scripture says that. That a pastor is concerned for the souls of the people. By the way, that's not just salvation. Not just salvation. I was 40 years in Racine as a pastor. Some people have asked me, how are you doing since you stepped down? And that's what I did. I felt like I, continue, I could continue further, but I believed it was time, and the Lord made that simple and clear to me. But the burden of being a pastor hasn't left. Do I miss the preaching? Somewhat. But this, this, this is the glory part. Not that I'm trying to be uh, talking about how glorious it is, but to have the Word of God, study it, and be able to give it to God's people. Sure, That's the glory. But this is what? Two days a week? You know when the real work takes place? It's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's the real work. Uh, <clears throat> you've watched this family for 30 years. You've watched them go through trials, troubles, difficulties, and you've watched them Remain true to their Savior. Now, I know that he doesn't like me saying that. But you asked me to come and speak. <laughs> I couldn't say this to my own church. And still when I preach, I still have a pastor's heart. And what I miss is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's my heart being knit with the people. Because now I just go and preach to folks and then I have to leave. Brother, I talked to you about Mineral Point. Any pastor who has a pastor's heart they understand very clearly what I'm talking about. I was only there for one service, preaching to those dear folks, and uh, boy, my heart went out to them. I could remember the days in Appleton when there were only 10, 12 people there. When we first went to Appleton, that's the first church I pastored, uh, <clears throat> it was Mrs. Williams, Jocelyn, in a little baby carrier, we didn't have the modern day stuff that they have now. It was just a little baby carrier. And Mrs. Williams would sit on the front and prop Jocelyn up. And one other person would be in the congregation on Wednesday. You see, I never forget those days. What you need is someone to live, live it, not just speak it, not just preach it but to live it in front of you. And honest truth, I believe they've done a good job. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now, I understand that here it's talking about the last days, what's taking place. But notice what verse 7 in chapter 3 says. For yourselves know how that you ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. It's talking about the last days. When I was in Bible college, I was fascinated with prophecy. Now, I know that was over 100 years ago, but anyway, 
I was fascinated with prophecy, and I would read about it, study about it, and such. And and in all that reading and all that studying, I heard that the Lord is coming back. And I thought, well, Paul believed the Lord was coming back in his day. And I believed the Lord was coming back in my day in Bible college. But I kind of prayed like every selfish Bible college student. Lord, don't come out. Don't come back until I had a chance to pastor until... Do you follow? Trying to make deals with God. And I found out years ago, making a deal with God's not going to work. But anyway, but back then, I could not physically see the fulfillment of the prophecies that are given in this book. I could not understand how that in 2 Thessalonians, that where it talks about that uh, the wicked one would come and spread a lie and the whole world would assent to the lie and believe the lie. However, beloved, today I do. Haven't we for the last year and a half to two with COVID virus, leaders speak and the people almost like sheep follow and agree with what they say and bow to whatever is necessary. I'm not here to preach against that. I'm just simply saying that I can understand, I can almost hear the hoofbeats coming. And my beloved, listen, Jesus is coming back. For those of us who are saints, those of us who know the Lord Jesus as our Savior, that's a tremendous comfort. And we look forward to the Lord Jesus coming back and redeeming us not only spiritually, but redeeming us physically and ascending into heaven with him. Amen. However, are you like my friend Scott that I spoke to the other day? We are concerned about your soul. We're concerned about what about if Jesus were to come. Sure. If I understand Second Thessalonians, if Jesus come, when Jesus comes back, those who are lost will believe the lie and there won't be an opportunity to be saved if you've heard the gospel one time. Brother, I hope I'm not treading against your theology here. But that's how I understand what it says in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. What about you? Most of what I preach has been to the congregation and those who are saved. Have you learned, received, heard, seen? However, those who might be here this morning, I uh, spoke to a young girl yesterday. We stopped at a place to eat supper, and I spoke to a young girl, and I said, uh, listen, uh, I'm preaching at this church and would uh, like to invite you to come to the church and hear us preach. And uh, <clears throat> she says, well, I have to work tomorrow. She said, what time? And I told her the time, and she said, well, I'm supposed to work. I don't see her, but uh, she works at the A&W. Maybe some of you go by and leave her a track. I didn't have one at the time, but I invited her to come today. But maybe someone has invited you to honor this special day that's been set aside. And you're here and you've never yet trusted Christ as Savior. Or perhaps you're here this morning and you're just on the brink. You're not sure where you really are. Beloved, what you need to do is trust Jesus as your Savior. This day, even though we're honoring this family, this church, most of all what they wish and wish for you is that you trust the Lord Jesus as your Savior this morning. That would be one of the greatest blessings that they could have. And for you, it's the hope of glory. And be secure in your being. That you know if the Lord Jesus comes, boom, you're going to go up with him. Sure, amen. Beloved, what about you? 
Will you confess the Lord Jesus today? Confess your sins. Confess him as your personal Savior and trust him to save you. And those of you with the church, just do it. Do what you've learned. Receive, heard, seen. And the last part of the verse, notice it does say, and do. Do it. And the God of peace, that's the salvation. The God of peace will come and reside in you and give you a peace as it said in verse 7, that what? Passeth all understanding. I gave an illustration here a few months ago when I was here preaching. Dear lady in our church in Appleton, we had led to Christ. She had uh, lung cancer, had one lung removed, and now she's in the hospital, and she's fretting because they're saying they're going to have to take the other lung, and that's sudden death for sure. She's flailing back and forth on the bed, talking about, <clears throat> I don't want to die, I don't want to die. Um, they call me, I go to the hospital, I walk in the door. By the way, I'm just a kid in the ministry, not knowing anything, you know. I mean, the newness was still on me. <laughs> and all I had was a New Testament, and I walked up to her bed, just a novice, opened the scriptures and began to read some psalms to her. And I saw that dear lady calm down. And then I spoke to her. Are you sure you're saved? Yes. Do you know where you're going? Yes. Can you trust the Lord? Yes. Beloved, I saw what the power of God's word can do. Learn, receive, hear, see, do. Amen. Simple. Not a very deep man. Just simple. But will you allow the Lord to work in your heart and your spirit this morning that he might accomplish what he wishes to do with you? That's what this man's looking for. And me as well. Let's stand together, shall we? My Father.